Hello, everybody. Welcome to Monster Fest. Really excited for all the fun conversations and workshops that we're going to have this week. We're going to get started in just a few moments here while we let the room fill. Let us know where you're watching from in the chat. We are here with Renee Robin right now. Renee, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to see what you have in store for us today. <laughs> I'm excited too. It's going to okay. be lots of fun. Edmonton, Calgary, St. John's, Dearborn, Phoenix, UK, Ontario. Awesome. Oh, hey, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Friends joining in too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it looks like we have a good group of people here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Once again, welcome to Monster Fest. We are kicking off this series with Renee Robin. It's going to be lots of fun. This session is called Fantastic Worlds, and Renee will be showing us an awesome Photoshop series on how she put this image together on the right. I'm your host, Shireen Feridnia. I am a part of the Wacom community team. You can check out our products over at wacom.com. This will be a one hour session and we will be doing a Q&A throughout. So please submit your questions to the Q&A feature, not the chat or the hand raising feature. And due to time constraints, we will try to get to all of the questions as best as we can this session will also be recorded. We are also streaming over on Facebook. So to ho hello to everybody on Facebook right now. And we will be sending our participants a link to this video. We also have an exclusive deal going on right now, $300 off either model of the Mobile Studio Pro with code Wacom Week. We'll be dropping the details in the chat for that. And without further ado, I will let Renee take over here. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Monster Week. And uh, I'm going to walk you through making this image. So uh, I'm gonna do a screen share with you. And uh, I'm also gonna turn my camera down so that you can see it's gonna be upside down. So you have to like mentally cross your eyes a little bit. Uh, because I'm working on the uh, Wacom one. So uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of where this is going to go. So I'm going to share the screen. And uh, yeah, Shireen's going to manage uh, questions. I'm not going to keep up with the, uh, the chat myself because I got to try to finish this image in an hour, which is maybe a little tight. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how this goes. All right, uh, share screen. Okay, and we're gonna tip this down. There we go. Okay, so this is our image here. This is the base plate that I started with. Um, I am going to basically try to get this image to the promo image that you saw. So I photographed this outside on location with no strobes or anything, it's just natural light. And then in Adobe Camera Raw, I just pulled up the shadows and flattened the image a little bit. Um, so whenever I'm building a composite like this, I do try to like get as much information as I can and then I'll probably squish some of it out later. So first things first, uh, I want to get rid of her head because we're making a headless horsewoman. So I'm going to create a new blank layer. And I apologize, I am working on multiple monitors here. So some things you're not going to see. So I'm just calling this head remove. Do, 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 do. So this is Erin and her beautiful Frisian Ike. They are performers and an amazing equestrian pair. And uh, I'm very excited to have them to work on with this with you. So I'm just going to my stamp tool and I've set it to sample current and below. And I'm just gonna quickly get rid of this. And I'm not doing a perfect job because well, I'm gonna, you'll see, <laughs> it'll make sense. <laughs> Let me see here. And I'm just going to go over that just a little bit uh, and then I'm going to mask in the edge of that. Let's 
So first things first here is I need to make a harder edge because the edge on the jacket and the shirt uh, is a hard edge transition. I don't really like using soft edges when I'm working on masking. Uh, I also am not a big fan of the hard or soft round brush, but in this case, it'll do the trick just fine. So here is our headless horsewoman. <laughs> Step number one done. Uh, next thing I want to do is I want to copy over a cape. So this is another image from the same shoot. And I'm just going to zoom in nice and close here. And just Renee, I just want to mention there is an error with the slide. This is not a one hour session. It's a two hour session. So please don't feel rushed. <laughs> oh, thank God. Okay, good. I was like, I swear. So sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm going to slow down then a little bit because I was like, oh, I thought we had like, like 90 minutes and then 30 minutes for questions. So Thank you for clarifying you have that. Of time. Please don't <laughs> I rush. Can, yes. I so can sorry breathe a little bit more. <laughs> yes. Beauty. Okay, cool. So, uh, right. So, I'm just using this tool here. I never use this tool. It's actually one of my least favorite tools, but um, it does the trick. So, let's see. Alrighty, so I just copy and pasted it. So I just made a selection, hit Control C and then um, Control V onto this here. So now I have my own layer of this cape. Uh, I'm going Control T, which is transform, and then I'm going to flip it horizontal. And I'm just gonna try to line this up. So this is obviously far too large. And let's see here. Do, 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 do. Mm, this is like kind of where things you kind of have to like try to figure out how to place them. There we go. That's looking pretty good. Awesome. Okay, so one of the things that I love to do that I could do like super intricate masking on this if I wanted to. Uh, but first things first, I'm just going to put the blending mode of this onto darker color so that the sky here is going to start coming through. And then I only have to worry about masking this lace and the, um, the back of the horse here. So I'm just going to go in here, create a layer mask. I'm on my brush tool. I'm painting with white on a white mask. That's not going to do anything. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go through here and get this settled. Masking is not the super most funnest, most exciting thing in the world, but it looks great if you do it right. So, alrighty, perfect. Step number one done. <laughs> So what I want to do now is I want to make a selection. So what I want to do is I want to blow out the sky because I'm transforming this image from being shot during the day uh, to being to being photographed at night. And people are always like, well, why don't you just photograph something at night? I'm like, because it's just dark. <laughs> so I'd rather shoot something on an overcast-ish day or even on a bright sunny day and then transform it into an, an evening photo, like an evening looking shot. Um, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to go select by color range. Oh, first things first. That's a moment. So I, I want a selection. I skipped a step. So Alt Control Shift E or Alt Command Shift E is basically going to give you a merge layer on top. And this is just going to give me a, a spot to make a nice selection from after all the work that I've done. So select by color range. And I am selecting the sky. And then I'm hitting this plus here. And I am just going to select some of these shadows and just get all that blown out. And I'm gonna go, okay. So what I like to do here is this becomes my master mask. So because if I ever screw up a mask later and I want to come back to this, then I have this layer that's, it doesn't do anything other than it holds a perfect mask of what I've made already. So. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to create a curves layer. And I am going to click Alt, click and drag. I'm going to say replace layer mask. 
So I don't wanna ever have to redo my first mask. I want it to be done and I want it to be perfect. So now I have this finished, I'm making this invisible and I'm just calling this layer mask. Renee, we so have now, somebody wondering, what's the other item you're working on off screen? Oh, that's my, that's my keyboard, my laptop. Yep, I think that's what they're wondering. Yeah, yeah, so it's just my keyboard. So I have everything set up. Um, I don't, I use tons of tons and tons of keyboard shortcuts. So that's just what's happening there. Is that clear? Good enough? Yep. Thank okay. you. Awesome. Okay. So we've overexposed this, but what's happening is we're seeing um, how this is affecting the ground. And I don't necessarily want uh, to have all this, all these spots here overexposed. So I'm just going to grab my brush and it's on black and I'm just going to quickly get rid of the stirrups a little bit on the bridle here and get rid of these guys here because I don't want this overexposed at least not yet anyways. Renee are you working on a raw photo? Uh, this one is a is a tiff but normally I work on a raw um, just to save, just to save myself some time with this, I did a little bit of work on the raw file um, ahead of time. But yes, normally it would be a raw. So, but when I made this image the first time, it took me like four and a half hours. So I had to figure out how to speed this up <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> Let me see here. Okay, awesome. So that's looking pretty good. So if you want to see what your mask looks like, it's alt click. Oh, I did miss a little spot there. Perfect. <laughs> That's why we zoom out. All right. So step number one, done. <laughs> or number two or number three. Need to move this here. Okay. Uh, next thing I want to do is I'm going to bring in the sky shot. So this is how I'm going to kind of make it more of an evening image. So I went out one night and I photographed uh, a full moon in the clouds and I intentionally blew out the moon uh, because I knew I was like, oh my God, this is like perfect Halloween type of sky. It was full moon and cloudy and gorgeous. And I was like, oh my God, I'm using this one day. So uh, I found it here. And so I'm just copy and pasting this in. And it is obviously a little bit too small because it was shot horizontally or vertically and we're working on a horizontal image, but I'm just gonna stretch it a little bit. And I'm gonna put the blending mode onto multiply. So right now it is way too strong. I'm just putting this up around where the head is. I might move that later. And I'm gonna turn down the opacity a little bit. So I just, I don't wanna lose all the detail, but I kinda want this to start looking like it's a nighttime shot. So one thing I'm seeing though is that the sky here, this is a little bit too bright. So I'm gonna make an additional curves layer. I'm gonna copy this mask up and I'm just going to drag down the highlights just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. Cause I don't want this area here to be completely, I don't want this image, this part here to be completely blown out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what, what's going on there. So. That's what it would have looked like if I didn't get rid of all the clouds. And this is what it looks like now that I have. And this is kind of bringing this down nicely. Renee, we have a follow up question to the raw question earlier. Jason Campbell is wondering what's the difference or why do you choose raw over any other format? Um, it just has it just has the most information in the file. So uh, if you wanted to a raw file is basically like your totally fresh data. Anything else, whether it's a TIFF or a PSD or a JPEG, um, is going to be compressed a little bit. So if I can work on raw files, that's always my preference. And my next preference from there is either a TIFF or a PSD file. So if you're, if you're super curious about that, um, take some JPEGs and like really push the contrast and color adjustments and see where, how soon they start to break down compared to a raw file. Um, so if you have like blown out skies or something like that, or like crushed blacks in a JPEG, you can't bring back as much of that data as you can with a raw file. 
and some shoots there is there's no choice but to either overexpose something or underexpose something um, unless you have like a perfect sensor camera which I have 5D Mark III and it's good enough but it does have its limitations. All right. Uh, does that answer it for you? Yeah, I think that was a great response. Okay, cool beans. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna get to the fun stuff here and this is the fire. So I have these, these fire packs that I made. Um, I have them on my stock site and I love them because I use them all the time. And I'm just gonna start copy and pasting this stuff onto, oops, let's put that on top. Uh, I'm gonna start putting this onto the legs of the horse. So in this case here, I'm going to go on to screen mode because the screen basically gets rid of anything that's black in the shot. And normally there's a bunch of ways that you have to like counteract other pixel damage and stuff because you, you do lose some of the blacks that are actually in fire, but we're going to be putting it onto a black horse. So we're going to kind of gain some of that back. Let me see here. So now this takes a little bit of like warping to figure out exactly where we want this to fit. So I'm just gonna right click on this and I'm gonna hit warp. I'm just kind of start pulling this around, getting this to fit nicely. Gary Monroe is wondering, was there a reason why you're copying the mask rather than clipping to the layer below. I believe that was earlier, the earlier layers you were just working on. Oh yeah, um, it's just habit. It's just how I've built it into my brain and how I do it. There, you can do both, both are fine. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to mask out a little bit of this here so we can see So right here, you can see some of the original part of the fire stuff, and I don't necessarily want it to wrap out that far. I love that it wraps out the, around the edge of the leg here, so I'm gonna have to move this as well. Um, but I don't wanna see that really harsh edge. Let me see here. I wonder if we can use a smudge tool. Sometimes this works and sometimes this doesn't work at all, but. There we go. So I'm just using the smudge tool. It is blurring it a tiny little bit, but also, I mean, it's fire and fire has its own properties and its own way of moving. So that's number one. My computer likes to yell at me <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> it's kind of annoying. No problem. It's just participating in the webinar with us. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> Renee, someone's wondering if you have suggestions for good sources for fire and smoke images if you don't shoot them yourself. Um, I do shoot them myself, um, but that's why I started making uh, stock packs for people online because I do photograph tons of smoke and fog and fire for my own work because I'm using it all the time. So I made it available through my website. Um, so yeah, if you go to renerobinphotography.com, there's a link that says uh, artist stock, I believe. And uh, you can pick up stuff there. But otherwise, I'm not really sure where to get good fire because that was the problem that I had was I was just like, where can I find a really great fire? It doesn't seem to exist anywhere. Uh, and so I just said, well, enough with that. I'm just going to do it myself. And so that's what I did. Uh, let's see here. Let's grab some more fire. So this is gonna be the back foot fire. And again, I apologize, I'm working on two monitors. So some of this, the really boring stuff you won't see. <laughs> so again, just copy pasting. And let's see how we want this to look. Put this onto the screen blending mode. And 
That looks kind of fun. Do, do, do. Zoom in, thank you. We have a question about the sky that you just worked on earlier. Are there limits to how much you can stretch a sky to fit a scene, for example, from a vertical to horizontal orientation and not distort it? Uh, yeah, for sure you're gonna have distortion. Um, I mean, the bigger question is like, where is your image going to be presented? Um, is it going to live on Instagram and Facebook? Then chances are you have a lot of leniency. Uh, if you're planning on printing it really big, then you might start running into these like big distorted stretched pixels and it's not gonna look very good. Um, so it really depends what you're wanting to do with the image on what your flexibility is. Most of my stuff I like to print, so I try to limit the amount of stretching that I'm doing. Um, I don't really like to take a vertical image and then stretch it to a horizontal one. Um, I do find that it gets pretty degraded. Uh, in that case, I would take multiple horizontal shots and then try to mask them together to make a cohesive horizontal piece and then bring it in. Another follow-up question to that. Tamara is wondering, have you played with the sky replacement tool they have now? I haven't yet, actually. I haven't updated uh, yet, but I will be. I'm, I'm super curious about it. I have heard good things and then I've heard not so good things. So <laughs> um, anything, man, anything that makes like our jobs easier, I'm in for. Like, I'm just like, yep, make it easier, make it faster, automate it. I don't wanna mask out tree branches. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I have to, I have to play with it myself yet. So, but I am all in whatever makes everything easier. <laughs> Let me see here. Trying to figure out how exactly to align this without it making it look like this horse has fiery farts. <laughs> That would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so basically what I'm paying attention to here is what the fire is doing in this part of the of the fetlocks. So I'm just going to go in here again and mask some of this out. So Renee, while you're working on the fire, since this is monster week and we are talking about all things spooky, I would love for you to share one of your spooky ghost stories that you were telling me about earlier. <laughs> well, we don't really know for sure if it's a ghost story, for sure, for sure. Uh, that is true. And that's what yeah. makes it even more eerie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there used to be this thing, uh, I grew up on a farm out in the middle of nowhere and uh, you know, we would see weird stuff from time to time. I mean, we lived on one of the old paths where pioneers would come. So there were lots of like old houses and shacks that people had lived in uh, when they were moving across the country. And so one day, I mean, this happened for years, but one time in particular, uh, we were coming back from, I, I did ballet for a number of years and I was coming back with my mom after class one day and it was winter and I live in Northern Alberta and it was like minus 30 degrees or something like that Celsius. So it was freezing cold. And, uh, and we had, we, we look out into the shop and that's where like the tractors were and everything. And the shop door was open and the lights were on. And we see my dad working out there on one of the vehicles in like his summer coveralls. And we're just like, what is dad doing outside? It's freezing out. It's dark. You know, what is he doing out there? And, uh, and <laughs> My mom's like, okay, well, you go inside. I'll go outside and talk to your dad. And it had just freshly snowed. And so I go inside and my dad's in the kitchen. <laughs> and so then we, my mom walks out to the shop and, you know, she looks around. She can't find any footprints, can't find anything, but the shop door's open, the lights were on. And, you know, comes back inside and she's just like, what the hell, your dad's not out there. And I was like, yeah, so dad's in the house. <laughs> and that happened all the time. Like my cousins, my aunts, they saw this like duplicate of my dad. It was it was so, so, so weird. <laughs> that is so creepy. It gives me like goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really weird. We don't really ever know. We never really did find out why that was a thing. It was just like it happened for a bunch of years and then it stopped happening all of a sudden. So 
yeah it was wild yeah it was very very strange um sharing that with us (laughs) (laughs) yeah i'm never really sure like when i tell people that kind of stuff i'm like so yeah i don't really have an answer um (laughs) but like it's more than like it's it's one thing when you see it right but it's another thing when a bunch of other people see it right so like my aunts and my uncles and my cousins started seeing this like duplicate of my dad around the farm and it was just like why like where is this coming from it was super strange (laughs) so strange yeah yeah it was really weird um so what i'm working on now is i'm just adding some color into the grass here i'm just made a soft light uh layer but what i want to get is i want to get a selection uh from the grass itself so i want this like overexposed grass So I'm just going to cheat. I'm going to go by color range. And let's turn down the fuzziness a little bit because I don't want it over all of the grass. I just want over some of it. I'm going to go OK. And I'm going to go here and I'm going to apply this mask. And I'm going to get rid of that layer because it doesn't need to exist anymore. Renee, do you mind sharing us really quick? Claudia is wondering if you could explain how you remove the black from the fire again. Oh, put the layer on screen mode. Yeah, so you just you just go to your your layer here and your blending mask. So this is normal, and then we just put this onto uh, screen blending mode. It's super easy. Um, so yeah, so first things first is I'm just adding. This is basically like a base coat of color. Um, I don't necessarily want it to be, let's resample that color. I don't want it to be over all the grass. I'm gonna paint in some of this stuff later too by hand. So you will see what's going on. And let's mask out that stuff in the distance because the light from the fire would not be affecting the grass way back there. Let's turf that. There we go. Okay, so sort of masked out grass <laughs> with like a little bit of a glow. Um, all right, now I do want to add, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit here and you'll see more of what's going to get added. But what I want to do is I want to uh, work on the eyes. So I'm going to select this mask, this layer here again. Um, Let me see, how do I want to do this? I always think to myself on this, I'm going to put this stuff here into a group. And I'm going to call this fire. Now, if I create a new blank layer and I put this onto overlay, And I'm just going to paint a little bit of color here over his eyes and expand it out a little bit around the rest of his features here. So that's going to be step number one. I just want to have like a little bit of color on these reflective parts, these buckles and probably up on his eyebrows there. Awesome. So I'm just going to call this one base color. I'm going to create another blank layer. I'm going to put this on to uh, color dodge. I'm going to pick a slightly more orange color. And this is going to be specifically for his eye itself. And that is a little bit strong. Sonia is wondering, how long have you been working with Wacom and how long did it take to get used to the tablet or the display? Right, so um, I am kind of a cheater in that uh, I started on Wacom when I was like 16 years old. Um, So I learned when my brain was still soft. (laughs) Uh, So I think it would be a little more challenging to pick up now, but what I always tell people is, Uh, get yourself like an entry level Wacom 
uh, something that's like, you know, not super sensitive. Um, like they had the, they used to have the bamboo line now. I'm not sure what you guys call that line now. Uh, um, but uh, anyways, I love starting people out on those. And basically if you're super having a hard time with it, um, I would try spending 30 minutes a day working on the internet on it, right? So like browse Facebook, do whatever your normal internet-y stuff is, and then, uh, then start, you know, making it into your illustration and making it into, you know, your daily stuff. But if you just try to like launch into Photoshop and you're not super comfortable with it, um, it's just going to frustrate you. So get used to how it is to navigate everything else first and then start getting into using it in Photoshop and your life is going to get a lot easier. Does that kind of answer the question? I hope. I thought that was great advice. Okay. Alrighty. So basically what I'm doing right now is I'm just adding different layers of dodge and burning just to give him kind of these like sparkly kind of flame like looking eyes, right? I think that looks that's looking pretty nice. So this gives me the base for what I want to do with his eyes. Because I want to give him also flaming eyeballs. <laughs> So again, I'm just copy pasting. Do, do, do. Putting that onto screen mode again. I do this a lot for this image, by the way. <laughs> you can spend a bunch of time masking out fire or you can work with blending modes. Brandon is wondering, how do you make a living with photography? Um, well, I mean, it wasn't so bad before COVID hit, but then COVID hit and that's made everything a little difficult for everyone. Um, but I mean, I work mostly in commercial advertising, so, um, that's kind of my world with it and what I like to do with it. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's so many ways to, to make a living in photography. Um, you know, you have to get a little more creative these days, but it definitely still exists. Um, you know, COVID is definitely a weird time to be asking like, how do you make a living? Because everyone is trying to figure that out right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, budgets everywhere are definitely slashed. So it does make it a little more challenging, but you keep putting out work and, you know, hopefully the world will turn itself back on soon and then we can get back to all the ways that <laughs> there are to make money in it. Um, I do tell a lot of people if this is the kind of work that they like to make, uh, you can make a pretty good living doing book cover art. So there's a lot of agencies out there that you can license work through or just license direct to authors. Uh, and that works pretty well. Let me see here. So I'm kind of liking how this is looking. Um, I have an idea and this might not work. I, I wonder if I can give him a flaming mane. I didn't try this in the original artwork, but I'm looking at this going like, oh, maybe, maybe. Let's copy this over. Um, I do usually tell people like name your layers and name your stuff and uh, I sometimes get lost in the work that I'm doing and then I forget to do that. <laughs> Let's see here. I wonder if this will work. Gabriella is wondering, does flow have a certain effect you're after over opacity? Yeah, so I don't adjust my uh, opacity ever. I only work on flow. Uh, I kind of try to leave my opacity at 100% and uh, then I'll drop the flow down um, depending on what I need. So basically the difference between flow and opacity, if you've ever done any painting is um, 
opacity kind of works like acrylic paint. So you do a stroke and then you wait for it to dry and then you do a stroke and you wait for it to dry. And that works really well sometimes, uh, but it can give you uh, banding. So a lot of my early work, I only worked with opacity and I never touched flow because I didn't understand it. And so I have this crazy banding in a lot of my early work because there was brush edges basically. And people are like, oh, you can just use a soft brush, but it still can give you banding. And it also like punches up your history like crazy. Uh, so instead using flow is kind of like working with an airbrush. So you can set it at like 1% flow or 3% flow. Um, and then just like, you know, in a single stroke have these really smooth, beautiful gradients. Yeah, let's see if this is gonna work. This is an experiment. I'm gonna make this group here, eyes. So I just select them all and uh, put it into a group. So B for brush and let's see, this could be an absolute waste of time. <laughs> but I wanna know. So nice thing is that I have this mask here already saved. So let me see here, click. I go control click on the mask here and I'm gonna invert the mask, control shift I and mask that out from her body because technically that fire would be not wrapping around that side of her head. And Sonia is wondering, what is your inspiration for these great creative ideas? Uh, sleep or, you know, the occasional last minute panic. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Um, yeah, I mean, they kind of just come from all over the place. Uh, I'll, I'll be looking at images or in this case, when I was looking for images for what to do for, for Monster Week, I just started going through folders of images that I'd shot and been like, okay, like what can we work with here? And then I found this shoot again and I was digging through them and I was like, oh my God, this shot is totally perfect. I think this will be great. Um, and then it just kind of fell together when I was editing. It just kind of pieced all together. <laughs> so uh, let's see, I'm gonna try blending options on this. Normal. Okay, so people always say like, oh, you should use blend if because it's awesome. I typically don't really like using blend if, but it can give me a good base for fire if some of it is looking a little too transparent. So I'm gonna turn this down. Yeah. Cause I don't like the edges that happen with blend if, it kind of looks a little janky to me. But it might give us just a little bit more body to compete with what's going on down here. And duplicate that again. It's not bad. It's not amazing. I might throw it out later though. We'll see. <laughs> um, the biggest thing to inspiration I find is you just have to play. Like, you know, even when I'm doing stuff like this, I'm just like, well, let's see what happens. This might not work. This might look absolutely terrible, but it could work out every now and then like totally random ideas make sense and then a lot of times they're just like no we should not do that but maybe it'll work i don't know i'm on the fence i'm on the fence <laughs> what if we I have another question in regards to the flames um yeah. with the flames or your other overlay image packs to convert them to be a transparency versus using them in blend mode approach for layering over other content um say that one more time sorry i guess they're i think they're asking if there's a way to use them in like as a transparent image instead of using them with a blend mode uh if you want to mask that out absolutely be my guest um i I'd never do that kind of masking, even for my own work on fire, because it takes forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, so yeah, if you have those skills and you want to do that, absolutely. Uh, I am not that person. I am not that kind of artist, so <laughs> I apologize. Um, you might be able to find something like that on Adobe Stock or Shutterstock or something like that, perhaps. Uh, they might have what you're looking for if that's what you're really wanting. 
Sorry, I'm just trying to fill out this fire here to see if it's going to work. And this experiment may have been just like a lot of time for nothing. <laughs> I'll leave it like that for now. I might throw it up. <laughs> the nice thing about working non-destructively is these are all just a bunch of layers and I can leave something on and then I can decide later like, nope, that was a terrible idea. We need to get rid of it. Um, so yeah, so the next thing, now that we've added like a whole bunch of fire, I need to add the glow because even though he has a black coat, there still would be a little bit of sheen on his body. So I'm going to create a new blank layer. I'm going to call it body lights. I am definitely going to copy up this mask. And I'm going to put this blending mode onto overlay. And let's grab some fire colors. Probably going to have to invert this mask, I suspect. Command shift I. Oh, bugger. <laughs> now, if you've ever accidentally drawn on the wrong layer, that is totally fine because I do that all the time. So this is what I was talking about. So in this case here, this mask is on the wrong side. So I want to invert that mask by going control I or command I if you are a Mac user. And again, I drew on the mask. <laughs> Anybody who say, says that they don't do that, they're dirty liars. We all do it. All right, Renee, while you add that color there, what is your favorite scary movie? Um, well, I mean, I know that there's like, let me see here. There's a lot to choose from. I haven't watched a ton of horror movies in the last few years, but I used to, I was a really, really big fan of um, uh, Silent Hill. Um, I love the game franchise. I love what they're doing. I love what they've done. And when Silent Hill came out, I was like, it's not perfect, but I'm totally into it. Um, let me see, what else is there? Uh, I should have thought about this more because I'm like thinking about masking and stuff. I'm like, I should make a list. <laughs> Um, I always love the Resident Evil movies. I realize they don't qualify as horror, but I mean, I love the, again, like I come from gaming. I love the game franchise. Um, so I would be super stoked if they ever made like a Dead Space movie or something. I would be like, yes, please. That sounds amazing. Um, let me see, what else is there? Uh, do, 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 do. Movie, movie, movies. I can mostly think of games right now, which is kind of embarrassing, like fear and stuff like that. <laughs> That's okay. That works too. Yeah. Um, we were also talking about Unsolved Mysteries earlier. That's a great show. Yeah, Unsolved Mysteries is back. Yeah, some of them are very, very interesting. Um, I'm excited that they're doing them again, personally. Let's see, what if I put this under here? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's so much good content out there. Um, I don't know, this is like modern spooky, but if you guys have ever reread recently V for Vendetta, um, it's spooky for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> You're just like, Helen Moore, why are you so accurate and prophetic? Like, no, <laughs> you weren't supposed to be writing a how-to manual. It was supposed to be a warning. <laughs> and here we are. But uh, yeah, that was that was disturbing. I hadn't read V for Vendetta in a number of years. I mean, I read it when I was a teenager because every angsty teenager needs to read V for Vendetta. Uh, and then I reread it again last year. And I was just like, oh man, what is happening? <laughs> it was unsettling. Yeah, guys, let us know your favorite scary books or movies in the chat. Share them with us. Yeah. Let me see here. Um, oh, we need more color on her foot. That technically would be glowing. A little bit of color here. Renee, we have a question coming in from Facebook. 
Yep. What's up? They, they're saying, I usually struggle with trying to put things together and make it look like they're in the same photo, but I find it really hard for it to not look like it's a sticker on top of everything. Any advice? Oh man, that's a, that's like, there's so many, so many reasons why that can happen. Uh, I mean, it can happen because something is shot at the wrong aperture or the wrong camera uh, lens. So if you're photographing someone with a 35 mil and putting them into a background that was shot at 200, uh, that can be a very difficult blend to make. So try to get your lenses as, as close as possible. Um, I mean, uh, your edges, like what your transitions look like when it comes to, uh, you know, what your masking looks like. So a lot of times people will mask with a soft round brush on edges that, you know, with this, in this case with this horse, if we masked him with a soft round brush, uh, you know, it would look like there's these glowing edges and it can often look stickery. Um, I mean, uh, another thing that can happen to make it look stickery is how sharp your subject is. So I see this all the time with composites is someone will photograph someone with a lens and they will shoot it at like F 2.8 or something. And they're putting him into a background that was shot at, you know, uh, F 11 and it's really sharp and crunchy. So if your background is sharper than your subject, it can look really strange, except for of course, where it's in focus. So in this case, if we look at this image, I'm just gonna go back here to the original shot. If we look at this image, right? These pieces here of the grass are out of focus and all this stuff here in the grass is out of focus. But this line here is sharp and along where the rider is is sharp. So when you're making your composites, try to keep in mind, um, if you're putting someone into a background that is really compressed, that's very, very difficult to do. And you have to really watch where you're placing them so that the sharpness um, matches up. Uh, it's a lot easier to put someone into a composite where it's not shot super flat. So it can be shot at like 16 mil or 24 mil or even 50 millimeters. Uh, and then shot at like a relatively higher aperture like F8 or something, because then you have a lot of playroom of where to put your subject. Uh, and that can really help, um, you know, deal with some of those like stickery problems. There's tons. I mean, there's so many reasons why an image can look stickery, but uh, I mean, keep at it. Like you're going to start noticing what's happening in the, in your work. Your, your taste is going to evolve the more that you do it. Uh, and definitely also ask for critiques from people who are, uh, doing this similar work to you and just be like, Hey, this is in my eye, this is looking, something's wrong with this. And either I can see it's this, or I'm not sure what it is and try to get outside opinion from it. Uh, because sometimes it can be something really simple as just like, you know, your color theory. Right. So Let me see here. I can add just like a little more color on him and then I think we will be good. Color of the legs. The fetlocks. I just noticed there's like a little bit of an error here on the fire. So this is from the fire wand. So I'm gonna go back here and fix that. And that is this layer here. So I'm just going to stamp. Normally I wouldn't stamp right on the layer, but eh, it's such a small little detail. Mm, let's see, slightly less flow. Somebody is wondering if you have any tips for how to make a good portfolio or any websites that you recommend? Um, what do you mean by how to make a good portfolio or websites? Uh, could you expand on that, please? Yeah. Whoever answered that question, could you please or expand on it a little bit in the Q and A, and we'll get back to you on that one. Yeah, because I'm not sure if it's like websites for hosting or websites to sell your work or websites for. Um, like sharing your portfolio or licensing, you know, um, there's a I lot think all different answers. Sharing. <laughs> Probably sharing your work online. Okay. Um, I mean, for sharing your work, there's the typical social media thing, uh, depending on the type of work that you're doing. Sometimes ArtStation is a good place for you to go. Um, 
uh, I mean, Flickr has is got you know uh, Smugmug's been doing a really good job at like you know bringing life back into Flickr again. So that's a good choice. Um, I mean, they specified for freelancing. Oh, for work, right? Okay, so as far as for work, uh, again, it depends on the type of work you want to do. You probably want to try getting into getting in with like a stock agency, like a book cover agency. Um, there's Trevelyan and Archangel. Uh, you know, you can apply to be a part of their roster. I don't know how many artists they represent at a time, but um, that can be a place to go. If that means anything. I'm starting to think I don't like this main. I'm staring at it more and more and I'm just like, no, you kind of suck. So I'm gonna go in here and erase stuff. Just too bad because the fire here on her torso looks really nice, but that's a little bit of a shiny surface, so it might reflect some of that. Okay, so um let's add some bats. How do we feel about that? <laughs> I am personally excited. <laughs> oh my God, I just looked outside and we have officially the first snow falling right now. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> or maybe it's not amazing. Maybe you're not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> it just is what it is. Okay, so this is, a, this is just a stock image that I bought off a website called uh, Can Stock Photo. Um, it's just a cheap licensing website. Um, I typically will, I typically try to make all my own stuff, but every now and then for little things like this, I will, um, I will buy them. So I'm delete that layer. I'm gonna put this money mode on multiply again. Again, like if I can get away with not doing a bunch of masking, I 100% will. <laughs> so I'm just going to roughly place these guys for now, and then I'm gonna figure out where I'm going to put them and then figure out like their placement and size and whatever else. So first things first, let's get all these guys in here. Emmanuel's wondering, how did you discover that this is your work style? I feel a little bit lost. I think um, <laughs> yeah, so that that never really goes away. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, or at least for me anyways. Um, you know, it's always like, is this the kind of work, like I'm constantly challenging myself, is this the kind of work that I want to be doing? Maybe is there something else? Um, and so I try a lot of different stuff all the time. And over the years, it just kind of became this, <laughs> um, you know, it's, art is a funny thing because you know, it's, it's such a personal experience and you're putting a little bit of yourself into every single image and you know, who you are as a person changes over the years. So what happens when you've been working on something in a certain style for a bunch of years and now all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you're like, I want to do something else. Like I want to do a different style and I want to try, you know, um, you know, going from work like this to, you know, super clean uh, product photography, right? Which happens, it super happens to lots of artists. And um, it takes a lot of time and reflecting and also just doing a lot of work. You know, you have to really put a lot of hours in and then figure out, you know, where is this going to go for you? What do you like? What do you not like? Um, I always tell myself like, hey, you know, if I'm, if I'm feeling stuck, I have to start doing a bunch of work again <laughs> and I have to just start like applying myself daily and reading a lot and you know really fueling my brain and it's it's just kind of tricky man it's hard to feel lost because your art is such a part of you and yet you know what happens when it starts feeling weird <laughs> um yeah just keep at it, man. Eventually something's gonna break for you. Um, take some classes, do some stuff that's like, even try something that's really outside of your normal. Um, so when I was feeling, oh crap, when I was feeling super stuck a few years ago, uh, I went and I assisted a bunch of my friends who do car photography. And I was like, I don't do car photography. I don't wanna do car photography. 
but you know I would help them and I would like you know carry lights and move stuff and you know basically just be an assistant and it gave me like this whole fresh perspective on my work of like oh wow that's super cool I never thought about that before maybe I can apply like one percent of what I saw today into what I'm doing which is going to change how I do what I already do and then all of a sudden I'm like more inspired by it again does that kind of I ramble a little bit on that one I apologize <laughs> no that was great thank you <laughs> let me see here all right so bats what are we going to do with these guys they're obviously all way too big um Let's see. Someone Let's was see. wondering why you were using the polygonal tool to select the bats versus just the lasso tool. Um, just again, because it's just the tool that came to mind when I was doing it. Um, I, I prefer because I know I'm working with a blending mode, I can just like select around it and then put a blending mode onto multiply because multiply is the opposite of screen. It gets rid of all white. And these bats are have been created on a perfectly white background. So I was like, I don't have to do a perfect selection. I can just like bring them over loosely so i would rather deal with that than you know sometimes what happens with certain selection tools is you get like these pixelated edges stuff makes me crazy <laughs> let's see here we're gonna make this guy a little bit smaller he's gonna be flying away uh, we don't need him flying into horse butt so we're gonna move him over here Uh, make them about yay big. Um, I don't live anywhere where there's bats, so I'm grossly unprepared for how big to actually make these things. But it's also a story tale, fairy tale thing, so maybe, <laughs> maybe there can just be like a bunch of different sizes. Make him nice and far away. So of course, things that are further away. The reason why I'm reducing the opacity on these bats. The things that are further away have less contrast and less saturation. So um, I could do clipping masks if I wanted to, or I could just reduce the opacity because it's not going on to a super textured background. And let's see, what are you? Do, do, do. Can make him a little bigger. Chris M is wondering, how did you land your first job in the digital photography world? Uh, oh man, I'm trying to even remember what that job was. <laughs> um, I don't remember, uh, that was a while ago. Um, Let's see, first jobs that I, are maybe worth mentioning. I mean, there was lots of jobs at the beginning. So I got into this though. So I got into digital photography differently than how most people get into it. So I got into it because I got into a bike accident and I got run over. And uh, so that really uh, limited me for what I could do. And so I wound up just teaching myself photography and digital, digital art while I was stuck in bed. And eventually I started getting hired for that kind of work, which I thought was crazy because I was like, you know, I just wanted out of the bed that I was in, right? I didn't want to be stuck indoors needing help to just like, you know, put clothes on and stuff. Um, so, you know, I photography for me never really started out being something that was like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And this is my life goal. I mean, I lived in, in Alberta uh, you know, in a, in a city where people mostly, uh, you know, they go to work in the trades, which is what I did. I went to school for the trades. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what I figured my life was going to be. And then all of a sudden one day it wasn't because <laughs> I couldn't walk. So, yeah, I, I always feel weird giving advice on that kind of stuff because everyone's situation is a little bit different. Um, I did do a lot of album artwork for bands. I did a lot of book covers for authors. Uh, and then I started booking a little bit more into the commercial advertising side. And a lot of that, um, there was some, some definite sheer luck <laughs> in there with some of those jobs at the beginning of just, you know, happening to be at the right place at the right time. Let's see here. 
I don't want it to look like, <laughs> so if I put this bat here, it's going to look like it came out of her head. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, this is also why you name your layers, because otherwise you wind up doing what I'm doing, which is turn the layers on and off again and figure out which bat is which. <laughs> and it's terrible. I have to confess, I never name my layers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. It's such a bad habit. It's the worst habit. And yet, it is, and I do the same thing. I end up clicking around until I find the right layer. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. I'm just like, oh man, <laughs> like I know better. <laughs> I totally know better. Let me see just, here. I always go against everything I was taught. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. It's just like, it's embarrassing. Alrighty, let's call these guys bats. And again, because we're working non-destructively, I might go back in and like move these guys a little bit more or whatever, but it's looking not too bad for now. Uh, Alrighty, so we need to add some haze into this thing. Open with Photoshop. There we go. All right, I'm gonna close down some of these layers because I don't need them anymore. No. You. Yeah, so if you keep a bunch of your stock files open, oftentimes you're gonna you're gonna get the error like, oh, your scratch disk is full and you can't do anything. Uh, that's really depressing. So try to keep your um, panel here as empty as possible. Also, it doesn't hurt to do a quick save. So I'm gonna save this as a TIFF. Just so that on the off chance everything crashes and the auto save feature in Photoshop fails, which it's not foolproof every now and then it does totally bomb. Uh, you can kind of relax a little bit. Let me see here. All right, so this is a haze layer. So this is again like one of the stock packs that I made. Um, like I basically I sell what I use all the time because I use it all the time. Um, so here again, I am just going to rotate this figure out exactly where we want it to be. Blending mode on screen. Let's figure this out. Now I'm gonna have to mask out some of this stuff. Like right around here, we're gonna have a hard edge, but eh, it's fine. <laughs> It'll be fine. All right, mask, brush. Make sure it's nice and soft. So just want to get rid of that horizontal line that's going through everything. This question came in a little bit earlier from Darlene Harris. They were wondering what is blend if they put in quotes. Oh yeah, so blend if is this, I, I was never huge on the blend if feature. But every now and then it's super handy. So blend if, um, let me open up a fire image again. Now that I closed them all. Sorry, that was very unfortunate timing. To ask oh that no, hundred percent not a problem. So we're just gonna copy this. So I'll be perfectly honest, I'm not a blend if master because I am a little weird about this stuff. So we just right click and go blending options. And so here it says blend if, and so you can kind of like pull this back. So this is basically saying like, what do you want to have transparent? So this is super handy if you have photographed someone on a, so they have like really dark hair and you photograph them on a white background. This can be a really easy way to quickly extract what's happening. And you can use, you hold alt and you can kind of like fine tune those transitions. So you can separate them a little bit so it gets a little bit softer. Um, it is super handy. I have friends who love and swear by the blend if tool. Um, it's not necessarily the right tool all the time, but it does work pretty cool. So that could be how we have our fire. And like I said, if this is going onto Instagram or Facebook and it's never going to be seen bigger than like your phone or computer, uh, blend if tool is like a super quick way to get some pretty complicated masking done. Um, 
but uh, I prefer to use screen <laughs> for most things. Uh, okay, so hey is number one. Let's close you. All right, so this is where I'm kind of adding a little bit more of the mood into the image. We got Hayes number two incoming. So this one I'm probably going to stretch a little bit. So this is like the vertical to horizontal thing, but it doesn't have to stretch too far. So let's just see here. Put this blending mode again on the screen. And this is going to be a little bit strong. So I'm going to turn this down. I just want it to fill in a little bit of what's going on in the bottom of the shot. So oops. that's before and after. So I'm going to have to add some color here because if we have fire in a hazy environment, then we're going to have this kind of like orangey glowy thing that's going on. So another blank layer, I'm going to put this onto soft light. I'm going to go to my brush tool. Come on. <laughs> if your computer isn't yelling at you, are you even working on it? And I'm just going to add a little bit of this haze into this fog here. Because haze really does a beautiful job of um, of diffusing light. So if you ever photograph, so here's, here's a cool experiment. If you ever have like a haze machine or a fog machine or a smoke bomb, go out at night and take a strobe or a flashlight or something and take a picture of your friend holding the flashlight to their face or the strobe to their face or whatever. Um, and then light off a smoke bomb or a haze machine or whatever safely, like do not burn down the forest because smoke bombs obviously are very flammable. Uh, but then take the photograph and see what happens to the quality of light as it gets a lot softer and a lot prettier. Um, and it, have, it works that way even late at night. So uh, that is a super handy tool. So I try to always keep that in mind when I'm recreating this stuff in post that if I have a light source and I'm creating a hazy environment that I have to paint in those colors to create that haze as well. I love that, that looks great. <laughs> I really brought it to life. Thanks. All right, now we need to add highlights into this grass. And I'm probably going to add it underneath the haze, but we'll see. We'll see, we'll see. We'll see which looks better. So I'm creating another blank layer. I'm going to put this onto color dodge. I'm going to call this grass. Okay, come on. Do the things. All right. So obviously when we have fire in the grass here, I'm going to make this a little bit stronger. We would have highlights. So this is looking a little bit bright, but I have my pressure sensitivity turned on so I can um, change exactly where I want this to impact. And I'm just going over different parts of the grass. And I'm going to spend a few minutes on this and I'm going to change the color and everything else because grass has highlights. It would be reflecting what's going on in the environment. And it, once we zoom out, it's going to really look a lot more grounded. So this is also a thing that can make composites look a little bit stickery is the transitions from the subject to the ground. So you really have to wrap it in there and ground it, make it look like it belongs. And if you have someone standing in grass and you use a soft round brush to mask them out and to put them in, um, it doesn't necessarily look like they belong in there. It just looks like, you know, there's this like soft fuzzy edge and then there's these grass strands. So this is starting to look a little bit more like what would happen. So if you put a bright light behind the grass, it glows, right? It gets like a semi-transparent effect. And so I'm just going to try to recreate that a little bit here with this. With slightly different shades and different colors. Renee, are you using the pressure sensitivity to kind of make those thinner versus thicker strokes? Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. 
yeah, pressure sensitivity is definitely on. Um, I love having my pressure sensitivity on. Some artists don't, they prefer to, whatever they see is what they get, but I grew up drawing. And so I'm used to like the pressure sensitivity of a pencil and it's just more comfortable for me. Um, I don't really, you know, people are like, oh, the right way and the wrong way. I'm like, eh, it's fine. Whatever way works for you. Um, and sometimes it takes a little bit of experimenting to figure that out, but. Paola is wondering if you could actually show us your brush settings that you're using. Um, my brush settings, man, I'm on, I'm on two pixels right now, 0% hardness at 64% flow. I'm just on a soft round brush but it's only two pixels wide. So it's as basic as it comes. <laughs> and there are, there are such things as like grass brushes and stuff that you can use. Um, and they are quite handy, but I do find that the repeating pattern kind of makes me nuts and I'd rather just do it by hand myself. So I just see these like these tall pieces of grass here that are sticking up out of the ground. I just want to make sure that they have a little bit of glowing to them because they're interacting with the image. And I think it's important that they are featured. Sometimes I find doing this to be like a little bit meditative. <laughs> so if you ever kind of having like a bit of a day and you're a little stressed out. It's kind of like digital cross stitch. <laughs> Just sit down and paint some grass for a little while. <laughs> kind of take the edge off. Let's see here, we can head a little bit from the other side. How are we doing for time, lady? We're doing great. Okay. We still have about 45 minutes left, so take your time. Okay. Awesome cells. Then I will draw a few more grass strands because those little details will make a difference. Do, do, do. Let's change the color because I've been using the same color for a little while. Someone's asking, did you study at an art school? I wish, but I did not. <laughs> I went to trade school. I went to school to be a locksmith. So I did not do any art school. <laughs> I did a little bit when I was in high school, but it wasn't really, it never connected. Like I said, my, my plan was to be in the trades, not to be uh, making artwork for a living. So yeah, I wish I had gone to school. Um, now that I'm further in my career, I really do see the gaps from not having had like proper mentorship or, um, you know, having some sort of fine art background would have been massively beneficial, massively beneficial. It would have saved me a lot of time for sure. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to either have mentorship from an artist uh, or take classes um, it will help you in ways that you don't really expect. It's, it's kind of funny that way. Oh, let's see, do we want this underneath or do we want this over? No, I want this over, that looks better. So your order, your layer order, uh, super matters and how everything is going to affect. So yeah, I think I like it on top more. Um, Okay, so next thing we want to do is we want to add some sparks onto this baby. So again, these are just sparks that I photographed. Screen. <laughs> and let's shrink these down. Nice and small. And we don't want these everywhere. I just want little tiny pieces. Let's see here. So I'm gonna mask this out for sure. So brush. Come on. 
do the things. Thank you. Sonia's following up on the other question, asking why not go to art school now? <laughs> um, because art school is super expensive. <laughs> but I've definitely started taking more um, like art classes. I've definitely been practicing uh, hand illustration and painting more like tactile, tactile painting, uh, even just uh, using um, markers and, and pens and stuff has has really upped my compositing game. It's definitely made my work a lot better and I'm a lot more pleased with it. So um, yeah, art school though also, I mean, I just don't know if I can handle uh, how much brain power it takes to do school. <laughs> I'm not really sure. My brain's not as elastic as it used to be. So if you're young, man, uh, do the things, learn the things. You get you get tired earlier <laughs> as you get older. I always thought it was ridiculous when I was younger. I was just like, oh yeah, whatever. Like, you know, there's tons of energy and it's fine and it's, everything's okay. And then you like get older and you're like, oh my God, this sucks. I'm so tired all the time and I kind of hate it. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's a thing. Let's see here. That's too many sparkles there all right now there's some more sparks we should add some around his eyes too shouldn't we let's do that first let's grab the marquee tool come here there we go and let's grab just a couple of these guys i'm just gonna copy and paste this on here screen make that nice and small see how that looks a little bit strong let's turn it down a little bit it's looking not too bad what do you think so far? <laughs> I think it's looking awesome. I love the sparks. I think yeah, I love it. Touch. I love, love, love adding sparks. I have a sparks problem. I put them in images where they don't even belong. Like they don't even make sense. And I'm just like, yeah, let's put them in. <laughs> they just add a little bit of magic, you know? That's exactly it. That's exactly my thoughts on it. I'm like, it's just a little bit of, little bit of, you know, digital glitter and it looks awesome. Yes, I am all for the digital glitter. I like the way you put that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the glitter that doesn't kill sharks in the ocean or turtles. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Safe glitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's see here. Eh, kind of dig that. Let's add another one in. I might have just missed that, but did you have different spark? Okay, yeah, you did. I thought maybe you yeah. stretched them. No, sorry. Yeah, this is a this is a different different uh, spark layer. So it doesn't look like much, like on the original image. It just looks like mostly a black screen. But yeah, there are these like really tight sparkle glitter things. <laughs> so did you go out and make a fire then and shoot all these different little sparks that were coming off of it? Oh uh, yeah, I was going camping and I was like, cool. Let's set up the camera and just shoot a whole bunch. <laughs> That's a great thing to keep in mind, guys. Next time you go camping, go get that stock imagery. Yeah, man. You never know when you're going to need it. Yeah, 100%. Super handy. And I'm just warping this just to change up the uh, behavior of it so it doesn't look like it's the exact same stock pack duplicated. <laughs> so. Here. Someone here. said hashtag digital glitter. I think that's going to be a thing now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. I'm in for it. I'm all there. <laughs> okay, so we got a little bit coming up here. That's from this file. There we go. Okay, so well, now what do we need next? He needs some breath coming out of his nose, I think. Because if there's steam and everything else. Let's grab this guy. 
And sorry, I'm just, you'll see in a second here, an image. No worries, take your time. All right, so uh, this is another smoke layer that I made and this one needs a little bit of work to clean up because I don't want all of this stuff here and I could just mask it out, but I also could just uh, do a quick curves adjustment. I just want to mention really quick, we've had a couple of these questions. This session is being recorded and we will be sharing it on our YouTube channel. So there is a way to go back and rewatch. Yeah. Okay, so all I did there was I just did a curves adjustment to bring down the exposure. Um, but I want these kind of edges in this swirl. So I chose this smoke shape for this reason. Then I just merged it all up into a single layer. And we're going to paste this. Put it on top, screen. I definitely, this image, most of my images don't require this much blending modes, but <laughs> it was like, we have how much time to do this? <laughs> so I think originally I was told I had 90 minutes and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> what's the fastest I know, way? and then we cut it down to an hour by accident. <laughs> and then we're back to two hours. Yeah, I was but like, you were oh, no. of emotions. <laughs> I was so worried. <laughs> you know, we just like to keep people on their toes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, I can play that game. I can play that game. <laughs> like, what's your favorite horror movie? Oh, doing a live stream with Wacom is awesome. They, uh, <laughs> they tell you you have two hours and then tell you you only have 60 minutes. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that. I'm literally playing with you. It's totally, I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> We could have made this work in an hour. It would have been tight, but we could have made it work. <laughs> it's been super quick. Yeah, exactly. All uh, Jonathan is asking, how long have you been embracing horror in your art? And are you interested in trying, they said SCP stuff. I'm not familiar with what that is. Maybe you are. I actually am not familiar with that acronym at all. SCP. Um, Jonathan, yeah. maybe you can tell us what that is, but maybe you could answer the first part. Um, how long have yes. you been incorporating horror? Yeah, so horror um, was actually where I got like a lot of my big starts in the beginning was I did a ton of work for horror films, like um, films that were, you know, indie and, you know, they just needed a little bit of help. And yeah, I did I did tons and tons and tons of work with horror. Um, I did some work with the House Core Horror Film Festival in Austin as well, um, just to, you know, like they needed some help. And I was like, yeah, sure, I can you know, we can do that. It'd be fun. And uh, yeah, the horror industry was was super welcoming to work with. Uh, everyone was just really, really cool. It was a great place to start out, I think, actually, um, in the horror industry, because people just, the budgets aren't very big, like, to be perfectly honest, because indie horror just doesn't acquire, they often don't have a lot of money to spend. And, but it was just, yeah, the people were great. The people were super, super cool to work with. And like, I really don't regret any of my time spent in horror. Um, and it's just fun to make, you know, like, like, it's so creative, you know, you get on set and someone's like, hey, what are we doing today? Or like, we're cutting off somebody's tongue. And I'm like, what? That's so gross. And like, you know, in real life, that's disgusting. But you're like, you look at like the VFX artists, they've made this beautiful soap tongue. <laughs> that's going to go in someone's mouth and then there's like you know the rigging crew is like figured out like how to run the blood to like come out of somebody's face and then the actors like figuring out like well what would it feel like you know if someone was cutting off my tongue and um <laughs> it's just super creative it's just like tons and tons of fun and people who work work in horror you know and they work in this like scary field like everyone's always really nice <laughs> and like chill and whatever and um yeah i don't know it's it's just, a, it's a funny industry that way. I, I really, really like it. I don't know if that, again, rambly answer. I don't know if that answered appropriately or not, but. <laughs> they haven't uh, followed up with what SCP stood for, so maybe we'll find out later. Yeah, I apologize. Um, I'm not so oh, good. Oh, here we go. Secure, contain, protect stuff. Do you know what that is? Nope, no idea. So not that is either the SCP-173. Sorry, Jonathan, we're not sure what you're talking about. I guess the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm not that hardcore, I guess. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these are just like, um, these are just clouds that I photographed. And I just put these guys onto an overlay blending mode. And I'm just going to turn it down a little bit. Um, I do this a lot for like making kind of more spooky color grades is I'll play with the color. Like I'll take these sky textures just to, you know, add this kind of nibbly effect into the image uh, while adding like a really nice color grade. So the reason why I chose a blue sky is because I knew that the, the uh, flame and everything was going to be quite orange. And so I was like, well, if we have the orange in there and then the blue, it's gonna look really nice together. Uh, let's see here. It does look really nice. I like yeah. that choice. We have another question from Facebook. Um, yeah, do you use any other kinds of brushes that are maybe not in Photoshop? Do I use any other brushes that aren't in Photoshop? Yeah, like have you, do you download any external brushes? Oh my God, yes, all the time. A hundred percent. Um, yeah, brushes are, brushes are life, man. It's, it's everything. Um, I don't have a ton loaded on this system. My, my other workstation though, I have hundreds, if not thousands of brushes and I get them from everywhere. So like Aaron Blaze, he's a painter. He has amazing brushes. Um, Groot brushes does good stuff. Uh, they're just everywhere. Yeah. Brushes are they're an addiction, man. <laughs> they can become a problem. You like open up your brush panel, and you're just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling for like the perfect brush. Uh, but I love those problems. <laughs> Let's see here, I'm just like kind of pulling in a little bit more color. I just made another um, overlay layer and just bringing in a little bit more color to some of these areas. Chris wants to know, how do you organize your brushes? I don't, it's chaos and madness. It's the worst thing ever. So if you know anyone who's really good at organizing brushes, hook me up. Right now they're just organized by alphabetical. <laughs> I just have to remember, I'm like B, blood splatters. It's probably under B. <laughs> and then like, it turns out the ones that I want are called splatter or ink or whatever. And then you're just like, okay, racking your brain. Like, okay, which one is gonna be which? So yeah, there. if you figure out a good way to organize your brushes, hook me up because I, uh, it's not my superpower. <laughs> I'm the worst. It's kind of embarrassing. Let me see here, grass strands. I wonder if I can add some highlights into his tail because technically horse hair has some reflective properties. So we should stick some highlights in there. Someone else from Facebook was asking about the difference in the flame color versus the front legs and the back legs. Is there, how would you make them more similar in color? I guess they're wondering since the back legs are a little bit more orangey. More yeah. yeah. I mean, I like that they're not all the same color because it's different properties of fire, right? So um, this fire here is uh, impacting the ground. So I want it to have like this deeper red that's like connection to the earth. Whereas this here is a lighter color and it's coming up off the ground. So I like that they are two separate colors. Um, it definitely, it doesn't feel like it's just like one layer of fire, just like splat over the entire image. It definitely feels more alive to me. Uh, so I kind of, I kind of dig it personally. Um, if you wanted to unify it, uh, you could do like a color blending mode um, that was clipped to the fire itself. So you could create a new blank layer and there is a blending mode down here uh, called color. And you could uh, um, you could just like paint, sample the color from here and then paint that in. So that's one way that you could do it. But yeah, I love fire that feels like a little more alive. <laughs> Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Let's see, I'm still on the grass strands, good, okay. So I am just going to go in here and add a few more highlights because if we have a little bit of time to kill then I would do this on these images if I was on my own. I would definitely be adding some of these highlights in here. Um, that little piece of the buckle there would get some. While you add those highlights, Paula's wondering what is your favorite effect in Photoshop? Um, Let 
Let me think here. What is my favorite effect? I love being able to do frequency separation. <laughs> it's not really an effect. Um, let me see, what else is there? <sighs> I don't really use them, <laughs> if I'm honest. I'm kind of bad. I do as much by hand that I can. Um, I definitely play a lot with blending modes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of bad that way. But when I was first starting out, like I loved being able to make like 3D clouds and stuff. I thought that was just like the coolest thing ever. I thought that was totally rad. Which I realize is like a very anticlimactic answer. <laughs> Come on. Give me the highlights, buddy. So just drawing along the edges here. Making them a little bit more defined. And how are you achieving that reddish color right now? Yeah, so I just went back to the grass strands layer because it's on the color dodge. And I just sampled a color from the fire and I'm just using a soft round brush on like two pixels and then expanding a little bit to blend it out. So if he wasn't a black horse, it would be a lot easier to see like exactly where his musculature is um, and what that looks like because then I could go in and just like, you know, re illustrate in all the like the rippling uh muscle here but i'm not i'm not confident enough in my horse anatomy to do it on a black horse yet <laughs> so just gonna if i wasn't doing this live i might go in and just like spend the time but i'm doing it live with you guys and you will all fall asleep <laughs> it's, it it's nice to watch <laughs> <laughs> someone from facebook is wondering where you learned how to do color grading uh, man, just a lot of experimenting, like just like tons of like, oh, what does this look like? Awful, cool, next. Um, but I mean, there's so many resources out there now to learn like really great color grading. It's amazing. Um, like Bella Kotak and uh, Kate Woman both have amazing classes on color grading and I love them. Uh, and they're both like so brilliant. They do amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. So uh, if you're wanting to find out you know, more on like pushing your color game further. Like those girls have so much to teach. It's, it's just awesome. They have incredible brains and we are so lucky that they share them. <laughs> Here. Do, 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 do. Now, what does this look like if we zoom out? Does this look terrible? It's not bad, it's a little strong, but that's okay. Just stick a layer mask on that puppy. And paint with color, good. I'll just slowly bring some of this down. I find it's always easier to paint a little bit too much and then to retract it later with a mask. And that doesn't need to be there. All right, so this is where naming your layers is a super good thing. <laughs> Let me see here, fire. No. Oh my God, name your layers. Don't ever be me, don't do this to yourself. <laughs> that was this, that can go away. There we go. That's where it was. Cool. And okay, get rid of that. Awesome. Someone's wondering what's next for the Alchemist's library. Oh my God, I'm so excited. So we're working on that right now. Um, the next season of the Alchemist Library uh, is going to be winter. So we are, um, yeah, basically we're in the planning stage of that thing right now. So uh, if you're super curious, you want to know what's coming up with it, uh, sign up for the newsletter. We're actually doing a draw for a free copy of the library. 
um, on Halloween night. So if you go to the website, alchemistlibrary.com and put your email in, then you are automatically entered in for a cop free copy of it. So yeah, I'm super excited about it. That was like a project where I was like, I just want to make the stuff that I want to make. I'm tired of being told what to make and how to make it. And I want to do that with really cool people and people who I love and respect and admire. And fortunately, they were down to do it as well. And I count myself very lucky that they were willing to do that. So yeah, uh, keep your eyes peeled. I'm, I'm super excited. <laughs> Ultra stoked. Let's see here a little bit, maybe a little bit there. That's looking a lot better. That's looking a lot more grounded. What do you think? Let's add a little bit. That looks good. Yeah. Definitely looking like it's a little more alive. What do you guys think? Let us know in the chat. <laughs> yeah. I think it's looking awesome. There's always going to be one person in there that's like, oh, I could do better. And I'm like, do, do this live. Do this live. Do this while someone's asking you questions and let me know what you think. <laughs> Sasia says, so good in caps. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I am glad. Let me see here. Okay, now. Yeah, that little bit on the bridle, I think makes a big, big difference. That looks a lot better. So if we just turn on and off that layer, so see how it suddenly feels like grounded? You know, the fire really feels like it's wrapping around it a lot more. Yeah, someone said, looking good, the finishing touches of the highlights really make it. And then another person said, the lighting details is definitely when it starts to come together, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I do love some lighting details. Let's see, grass stands. Maybe we can add just like a couple more down in here. So Giancarlo is wondering, in your opinion, which tablet and size is the most suitable for a beginner? The bigger, the better, they're wondering. Uh, you know, if for a beginner, don't go, don't start with a pro tablet, start with like one of the entry level tablets. They're usually a little bit smaller. Um, I mean, one thing that's going to happen a lot if you're working on a big tablet and this happened to me in a bunch of years ago, um, I started burning out my rotator cuff, my elbow and my wrist because I was doing too many really big movements. Uh, so if you're doing this all day, every day, you can really, really injure yourself. Uh, so technically I like to go smaller is better. I mean, my, my pro tablets, I have masked down to like that much for two screens. So it's, it's actually, it's less than that. It's like this. And that's, that covers both my monitors. And that way, you know, when I'm working on this tablet, it's kind of a joy to like mask out hair and stuff and like do these little grass strokes. It's, it's very calming. It's very pleasing, but I can't work on this thing all day, every day, unless I'm doing like very specific masking, just because I do blow out, I mean, my shoulder and my elbow and my wrist. So um, I definitely prefer to start with like a medium or a small tablet um, and yeah. But I mean, everyone's different. Some people have more a more uh, useful meat suit than mine. Mine likes, pardon me, mine, mine likes to break. <laughs> so it kind of just falls apart sometimes. Um, so if your body is like super robust and you don't have problems with it, then like, you know, go for a bigger one. But yeah, I definitely suggest that smaller is better. Um, Wigam just came out with a new Intuos. I think you guys came out with the, the new Pro Small. Yeah, we have the Intuos Pro Small. I'm so excited for it. I want to get my hands on it so bad because like it's exactly what I've been begging for for years because the, the Intuos Pro Medium is the size of the old Small. And, and I was always like, I don't need this much space. Like, give me something smaller and smaller. And finally, you guys made it. And I'm so stoked. <laughs> yeah, I actually have that one. And I thought maybe it was going to be too small, but it's actually great. It's a great little tablet. And it's great for traveling because it's so lightweight. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah, I love, love working on a small tablet. I mean, even with this, um, you know, with this guy here, I've worked on the, the really big Cintiqs. And they're nice to work on part-time, but they're really hard to work on like all day, every day. That definitely gets, um, at least for me anyways, like I said, my, my body's not the most reliable piece of meat on the planet though. <laughs> so there's that problem. Um, so I'm pretty happy with this. One thing I want to do is I want to add a little bit of blur to these bats. Uh, let's see here. Let's fold this up into some layers. 
Um, we're just going to call this nightmare because there's <laughs> on the topic of horror. Uh, there's a bunch of folders in there, a bunch of <laughs> images. And so it's not, that's going to suck. Anyways. All right. So bat number one, where are you? Down on the bottom. He's kind of a medium size. So let's go filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And let's take this into here so you guys can see it. And let's blur him like two pixels. Eh, let's blur him one pixel. So what I'm doing is I'm comparing how blurry the trees are in the background uh, in comparison to how blurry I want him to be. So I don't want him more blurry than the stuff that's way off in the distance. So I'm just going to add a one pixel blur. Also, he's a small object. So a one pixel blur will make a big difference to him. Look at me gendering the bats. Um, <laughs> could be a female bat. Gaussian blur, again, I'm just looking here. This guy's going to be a little bit bigger and he's closer. So I'm just going to do like a 0.5 blur. Uh, this guy here, he's, he's really close and I think roughly the size. So I might leave him the same size. Let's see who's next. This guy here, super small again, filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Let's go 1.5 because he's kind of small. And again, looking at the edges of the bat to the edges of the trees. Let's see, you're next, filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And you can, I mean, there. you can also turn all these bats into smart objects so that you can always change your mind. Um, but I'm pretty locked into where I want these guys to be. And if I was ever to change my mind on these bats, it's so easy to add them again that I don't really worry about it too much. So again, this bat is a little closer, so we'll just do like a 0.5 pixel blur. This one here is nice and far away. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur, 1.5. And this one is the leader bat. Uh, maybe just a tiny little bit because he's technically moving but we do like 0.3 or something. It'll be almost not noticeable, but I don't want, so one thing I don't want is I don't want these edges of these bats to be sharper than her edges, right? So the way she's sitting, she's my main subject. She's my main focus. The eyes are naturally going to be drawn to the brightest, sharpest point in the image. And so I would like her to be number one. And then this bat here can be number two in sharpness. And which bat are you? Dennis wants to know, do you use smart objects in your images often? Um, if it's for clients, a hundred percent. I always use smart objects if it's for clients. Uh, if it's personal work, um, I am all over the place with the worst bad habits ever. <laughs> but yeah, if it's going to a client, especially if it's going to like an ad agency or something, um, I will definitely smart object the crap out of it, but it will make a really big file. So if you don't have a really robust computer, uh, smart objects are very, very, very hard on your system. So you really have to make sure that you have a lot of RAM, that you have a big hard drive um, and you have a lot of room on your scratch disk just for your computer to keep everything open. Because what a smart object does is it basically retains all the information. So you can take a bat, <clears throat> one of these bat layers that was like the size of this image and shrink them down to like, you know, just like a couple pixels wide and then shrink him back out again. And he'll be the exact, like all that information never disappeared. Whereas normally if you shrink a bat down, like so he's the full size, you shrink them down to a tiny little size and you try to stretch them back out again, they get pixelated and weird and distorted because all that information was destroyed. So that's the benefit of using smart objects. But if you don't have to use them, don't. Um, but yeah, if you're delivering a client, a customer, uh, like a TIFF file or a PDF or a PSB file to a client and there's going to be other people editing on it, uh, you definitely want to save as much information as possible so that the other teams can do what they need to do. And let me see here. I'm feeling pretty good about this. I'm going to add some color to this. So these are called color lookup tables. So I work out of this little half circle here a lot. And uh, in the interest of saving time, a lot of times what I'll do is I will just like pop into uh, the color lookup tables and see what they look like. Because sometimes I can get exactly what I want out of this and it looks great. So 
like I do uh, originally when I did this, I was like, oh man, this looks awesome, but it was just, you know, black and white. So it's not that red. Um, but they're handy, right? Like you can spend a bunch of time doing, you know, like hue saturation and, you know, color blending and stuff. And then other times you can just like tap through this a few times and be like, oh, what do you know? So I really like this one, uh, but it is obviously far, far, far too strong. So if we go here. Let's see what this looks like. Do, do, do. It's a little bit dark. Knock that down a bit. So yeah, um, from here, basically what I would do is sharpening. I think that's looking pretty good. So that's where we started. And that's where we ended. And I'm kind of into it. <laughs> it looks really cool. And I love what you did with the, the color lookup tool. That's awesome. I've never used that before. Oh man. So you can, you can buy like uh, LUTs and load them in here. Um, I used to have like on my, my other workstation, I have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I'm a ba as bad about collecting LUTs as I am about collecting um, brushes. So yeah, they're, they're so great. And you can just like tap through them and find like a, a really easy color grade. So um, yeah, so from here I would do sharpening. So this is one of the few times that I will merge up uh, because I can just, it's such an easy delete. Like, oh, I have to change something. Like I'm just deleting a sharpening layer. So it's not a problem for me. So I would just go filter, uh, sharpen and then uh, smart sharpen. So I guess if we're talking, what are my favorite filters? The smart sharpen filter is actually quite, quite rad. Um, I did a podcast once a long time ago with um, ProEDU and we had, the, I, I asked, one of the guests was one of the Adobe guys and I was like, dude, there are so many ways to sharpen, like which one is the best one? And he was like, oh, smart sharpen all the way. And I started playing with smart sharpen and I was like, oh my God, yeah, this is actually quite great because you can have, you can remove lens blur, Gaussian blur or motion blur. So in this case, lens blur, because I was running a fast enough shutter speed that there isn't really much motion blur to worry about. Um, but it just does this like really beautiful job of sharpening everything. I don't need to reduce quite that much noise. Um, like you can punch this like way too strong and you get these like weird glowy halos. So don't do this to your images. <laughs> don't do these halos. This, this looks terrible. Um, you know, it's, it's throwbacks to like early HDR stuff, which is, there's good ways of doing HDR. And then there are sad ways of doing HDR. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can also play with the shadows and the highlights, but I mean, typically that's enough for me. So I just wanna know how it looks. Turn this on and off. So I have like a little bit of a halo here on this piece of the fabric right there. So it's a little bit too strong. So all I do is just turn down the opacity of the layer. And yeah, and then from there, I'm just, I'm going to save this again, just because that's kind of how this goes. And so I'm saving this, um, I'm making sure uh, that it has all the layers. So I'm not saying discard layers and save as a copy, no image compression. I don't know what the heck this means. I need to talk to someone smarter than, <laughs> than I am. Uh, I'm just going to hit okay. <laughs> But yeah, so that's that's kind of how I would make one of these things. There's, again, like with all these things in Photoshop, there are 10,000 ways to get to the same point. Um, you know, there's different ways that you could shoot this if you wanted to. There's, I mean, you know, you could shoot this with lighting if you wanted to. Also, if you had like a really trained horse and rider, which fortunately these two are, um, you know, we could have put strobes in the grass or something, little speed lights or something, and just had them kind of like hopping around and, you know, just like try not to step on them. Um, but, uh, you know, you can also just do this all in post-production as well. So this looks yeah. awesome. I love it. Great <laughs> job. It's super cool. Um, another question came through that I thought was kind of fun. They're asking from your perspective, what can a horror artist do to increase their spookiness? And have you ever been spooked or scared by your own artwork? <laughs> okay. So, um, 
What can they do to increase the spookiness? You have to understand human psychology to increase spookiness because you have to understand what the fundamentals of fear really are and what it is that drives people to be uncomfortable. So uh, there is a great artist and I always forget their name. Uh, they do like big set photography and they're, they're, they've been featured on, on everything. Uh, but it's like this little girl sitting on a bed with like all these stuffed animals and it's super saturated and super colorful. And there's these big monster hands hanging out underneath the bed, you know? And so that's like a very fundamental fear that a lot of us feel as children when we're afraid of what's under the bed. And not everyone experiences that fear. So that's, that's another thing that like, the fear is such a personal experience, right? So, you know, what some people, what terrifies some people isn't going to phase other people because of the, the way they see the world and the things that have happened to them, um, they're going to filter things differently. And so it's going to set, it's going to essentially like trigger their brain differently. Um, I did an image once, uh, I really don't like spiders. And I did an image, it's not even that like a horror image, but it's like this blonde guy and he's got a flaming sword and he's about to take on this like monster spider. And I did it because I'm afraid of spiders. And in order to do it, I had to, um, <laughs> I had to have super troopers on on the TV <laughs> and I had to zoom in really, really close when I was masking, um, when I was masking out like the hairy legs. And I was like, it's just hairy legs. <laughs> They're just like, it's some guy's hairy legs, it's not a big monster. And then I got to the eyes and I was like, oh my God, mask quickly. Like, <laughs> but that's like, that's something that for me makes me very, very uncomfortable is like really big spiders. And so that was a way of me kind of like challenging my fear. Um, another image that, that got a lot of attention for fear is uh, the fear of heights. So uh, a bunch of years ago now, I did an image of a girl jumping off the building with little tiny wings, like, you know, semi-invisible wings. And people who were afraid of heights couldn't look at the image. Um, I had a couple of people message me saying that they almost threw up looking at the image. And the image isn't horror based at all, but it triggers people's fears. And that's really exciting. So if you, if you want to do that, you kind of have to decide which kind of fear you're going for and then figure out how you want to trigger that visually. And, you know, the beautiful thing about the horror industry is some of them, the more campy it is, the more they love it. <laughs> I mean, um, like Evil Dead, right? For example, uh, it's so campy, it's so cheesy and it's such a cult following because it's, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, people love it. So, <laughs> um, but you just kind of have to make those decisions for yourself and decide, you know, do you want to be like the campy cheesy horror guy or do you want to be someone who really understands psychological horror like Midsummer? Um, and again, some people like Midsummer, like what a waste of time. Uh, but, you know, it, it is, it's very, very well written horror and so yeah you you really kind of I'm blamp I'm rambling at this point but yeah you can do it I believe in you but you got to understand human brains and uh maybe take some psychology classes that might help you make really good horror I think that's awesome advice <laughs> Chris M is wondering what are the most useful hotkeys oh man so the best way to do this is uh reprogram your entire keyboard so um I changed my brushes up and down to Q and W. So I basically have everything that I need on the left side of my keyboard. Cause I got tired of like jumping across back and forth, back and forth, back and forth uh, when I was working on an image because it like, you know, okay, it's half a second here, but after 10 years, it's a lot of time and it adds up. And so um, I, I just like reprogrammed to all the shortcuts that I use all the time, which is like brush up, brush down, um, the hardness and softness of the brush, um, the, um, uh, stamp tool, healing tool, uh, brush tool, um, dodge and burn. Um, yeah. And that's like, basically like Q E, uh, Q U E R A S D F Z X C V. And it is going to break a bunch of other shortcuts. So if you want, um, you're going to have to, uh, it, it will screw up other things. So change your shortcuts carefully, but I can't believe how much time I've saved since like reprogramming my entire keyboard. It's just been awesome. I love, love, love having my keyboard reprogrammed. Or if you're not one that travels very often, you can get these gaming keyboards and they're like these little tiny ones and you just program the crap out of that. And uh, it'll, again, it'll save you so, so, so much time. Awesome. 
Sonia is wondering, do you always work in the dark? <laughs> <laughs> so it just happened to be dark here now. Um, <laughs> there is sun outside, but yeah, I do prefer to work in the dark. Not completely pitch black, but uh, I do like to work without too many other like really colorful lights impacting what I'm seeing on the screen. So if I have a bunch of purple lights in, this, in the environment, then my eyes are going to calibrate funny. So it's kind of like, do you ever, if you ever go like skiing or wear like tinted, tinted sunglasses. And so you, you don't have tinted sunglasses on and then you put them on, you're like, oh my God, everything looks really yellow. And then a few minutes later, it just looks like normal colors because your brain is filtering it out. And then you take it off and everything is like super blue. Um, I don't want my, my ambient light to be uh, basically normalizing the color <laughs> that I'm seeing. So I try to make the colors uh, in the bulbs as neutral as possible and turn down. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, so normally yeah. there would be at least one more light on right now, but in order to do that, I have to get up and. <laughs> awesome. Sonia says, great answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you so in. much, Renee. This was <laughs> awesome. This image looks fantastic. I love it. Super spooky, just in time for Halloween, which is great. So thank you so much again for being here with us. We have lots of people in the chat thanking you as well. Oh, I should I should hop into the chat there. Where do I see it? Uh, yeah, feel free to. It's right on the the bottom of the screen there. Ah uh, yes. Um, let me see. Do, do, do. Oh yeah, the flames are totally out of scale a little bit. Hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you were completely right. <laughs> but yeah, for a live stream, it'll do. <laughs> I think it's great, and there's lots of love in the chat. <laughs> so thank you guys so much again for joining. Thank you so much to Renee. I want to remind everybody of our promo that we have going. It is $300 off either Mobile Studio Pro uh, model, and that is with code Wacom Week. And you can go ahead and get that deal over on our e-store and check it out. We also have some great uh, other Monster Fest sessions coming up later. We have a panel with the Monster Mavens, lots of creature creators, so that's going to be awesome. And then after that, we will have Valfrey on and that will be in Spanish. So we invite all of our Spanish speaking friends to join us. Um, she'll be showing us her illustration process and possibly talking a little bit about her spooky merchandise. So it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Renee, again. This was super fun and have a great afternoon, everybody. Yeah, thank you again for having me on. And I can't wait to even see all the other uh, speakers. They look amazing. I'm so excited. <laughs> so thanks yes, for having please me. join us. We would love that. <laughs> 100%. Awesome. Have a good day, everybody.